Okay, welcome to another episode of the 15 Minute Juice. As you can see, Mike, you can always guess where I'm going to be, right? I don't have palm trees today. So uh, a <laughs> little colder here, a little colder here, but I'm back in the old stomping grounds. So uh, I'm here and we have a freaking home run podcast today. Um, great job. This was all you. Uh, you continuously were messaging them and, and trying to get them on. So this is super valuable information. We have Dr. Dotson from Rothman Orthopedics on today. So uh, Dr. Dotson, welcome. Uh, well, thank you for having me, Joe and Mike. It's uh, a pleasure and a privilege to be here talking to you guys. So this is, um, so what we do is we have a podcast, but we also have a 15 minute segment that we do called the 15 minute juice, kind of just to throw out a question, maybe two or three and have you answer those. And then hopefully we can get you back on if we have some other questions and things like that. But uh, Mike, since this was, um, this was your, you know, you're doing, I want you to kind of go first, kind of ask Dr. Dotson some of the questions that you have. Yeah, so I think um, a, a great thing about bringing you on is because you have an awesome spectrum of what you see with these injuries, you know, working also with high school, college athletes, but then even up to, you know, pros, the Philadelphia Eagles and, you know, um, the sports team. So that magnitude of, of what you're seeing with these injuries, I think it'd be great for you to maybe talk about maybe some of the similarities or differences that you're seeing with that, you know, and, and what it's like, to, you know, when you're taking a step back and seeing these orthopedic injuries, you know, um, you know, what direction are we going in when it's coming to managing these from like a surgical perspective and some things that you're seeing just dealing with that whole spectrum? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you guys again for having me. Um, so, you know, one thing I've been in practice since 2009, so whatever it is, 14 years. And so one thing I've, I've definitely seen more and more is um, complex injuries in younger and younger athletes. Um, I can tell you that when I first started practice, as I started working with more elite athletes at the collegiate professional level, there was a lot of injuries that we saw there that I didn't see, um, you know, teenagers and adolescents have. And I can tell you that that's changed over the last decade or so of my career. And, you know, people ask why that is. And it's probably a, a function of, you know, bigger, faster, stronger, right? I think uh, younger athletes, kids train now harder, uh, they've gotten bigger, they've gotten faster. You know, we always say uh, uh, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, version 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 of, you know, as as time has gone by, you know, these kids have gotten more athletic and stronger, working with great strength coaches. So it's probably a manifestation of like some of that's, um, some of that is just exposure and 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 them getting, you know, bigger and, and, and stronger. Um, you know, I do think that there's a lot of correlation. I do think that work with uh, professional athletes uh, and, and high level collegiate athletes has helped me with some of our you know, high school and adolescent athletes from a standpoint of um, I've learned, you know, to some degree what the body can tolerate. And so my experience at a higher level has allowed me to kind of uh, translate that to, to my everyday athletes and say, like, you know, well, I've seen this work or I've seen patients tolerate this particular spectrum of pathology. Um, so I don't see why you can't, you know, and I think honestly, in some ways, I've become a little more conservative. I, I'll give you an example. You know, cartilage injuries are a significant thing we see in the knee and in, in athletes. And I can tell you that um, a lot of the cartilage techniques that we use um, work very well, uh, but they're invasive mm -hmm. um, and they require time. And, 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 you know, for example, cartilage transplant or, or osteochondral allograft implantation, you know, and so when you see that at the higher level and you realize that performing those surgeries on an elite athlete you know, quite frankly, is career threatening from a standpoint of time loss, invasiveness, et cetera. And you see them be able to perform at a high level asymptomatically. It's made me take a step back at times and say, look, I've seen this in this scenario. Perhaps we can treat this conservatively and not be so aggressive just because you're a bit younger. Right. Um, and, and, and you obviously can't apply that across all things, but I, I definitely think it's helped me a lot, quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of, you know, what I was going to get, get after as far as asking, you know, what your opinion is on a high school athlete returning to play, what what fra what time of it, like nine months, 12 months, where does that kind of land for you? I know the question is always going to come down to it depends on the athlete and things like that. But if we were to take, again, most of what we're seeing is a 13 to 19 year old female soccer player, right? Yeah, so yeah. most of them don't have a foundation to begin with, right? They're coming in here. Their legs are as big as my pen. 
you know, yeah. um, there's just no, there's no foundation to them. So um, then you have the, the outlying athlete, you know, maybe the football player that, that looks fantastic at six or seven months, but what in your, in, in your eyes, what are you saying is return to play yeah. for a proper high school athlete? You know, it's a great question. So I would say I'm, I'm performing about 600 surgeries a year. Wow. And as of last year, a third of them are ACLs, just ACLs. So it has become a significant part of my practice um, with significant stress level of taking care of all these young athletes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just take a step back. You know, when I first started practice, you know, six months, seven months return to play was not uncommon. And I was letting athletes go back at six, seven months. And, you know, I can't say I had a, a significant issue that made me change, but it was more of an experience. And experience was that in the NBA world, we were telling general managers one year. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and furthermore, you know, I took care of a couple of some NBA players who were coming off of ACLs and we had this sort of a very extensive return to play testing. I mean, let, let's call it circa 2011, 12, 13, around then when, when that wasn't as common as is now. Right. And I, I remember thinking I'm this, this 24 year old elite athlete who's rehabbed every day, who has nothing else better to do, but rehab. I'm putting through this rigorous return to play program. Right. And then I'm turning around and letting a 16, 17 year old female soccer player return at six months in an office visit where I like, Oh, it feels pretty good. It mm -hmm. seemed kind of crazy to me and yeah. it made me change. And, you know, one of my partners, Dr. Kevin Freeman was, should be credited in our practice was really saying we need to come up with some sort of return to play guideline test. And he really pushed for that. And I was involved with that as well. And we got physical therapists um, and, and athletic trainers involved as well to kind of come up with the criteria. It's not perfect, but show me a little bit more of what you can do before I let you return to play. Right. And Let I me think see quality of movement, right? Let's see the quality. Well, let's see how you move. I mean, I'm doing it at one time. Let's see how you move, how you land, how you yep. run. Yep. That's exactly right. And then I would say, and those are all the things we're looking at in the elite athletes, the pro athletes. And then I would say from a biology standpoint, there was a great study that just came out. If you wait nine months uh, to return to play after an ACL, your risk of recurrence drops 30%. And every month thereafter, another 30%. And so when you hear that, and you and we know that um, yeah. ligamentization takes at least nine months up to a year in the lab, you go, well, what are we really doing here? You know, yeah. and, and yeah. you guys see it as much as I see it. The second, third, I just saw a young female, it's her third ACL in like, yeah. you know, 19 months. Yep. And she just reached four. Yep. Um, it's, it's a big deal. So I think um, I, I'm saying nine months at the earliest. That's my goal. I, I don't really care if it takes 11, 12 months. I mean, I know that's easy for me to say, but I'm, I want to make sure the patient feels comfortable that the, the movement looks good. Um, and so for me right now, it's nine months because of the literature, because of what I experienced, uh, and elite athletes. And, and I think if you look at, if you look at, um, a lot of the athletes that everyone wants to watch on TV, and you you analyze the return to play. It's about that. You rarely see an elite athlete now come back quicker. Yep. You just don't. You know? I'm I'm glad that you said some of those things because they're the things that I explain to parents all the time. And it is absolutely no disrespect to the surgeon whatsoever. But I'm like, the surgeon can't really. They're seeing you in the office and they maybe tug on it, have you get up and and hop once or twice. They're not seeing you under fatigue. They don't see you on the turf when I have you. And so what we're looking at right here on the camera is I'm basically tier three and what we got going on here, right? You're the yeah. surgeon. Mike is the PT. I'm the strength coach. And I have you clearing and Mike clearing. And then they come to me and I'm like, you're not ready for to go back to playing. You may be clear to do participation, but yeah. what does that look like? And, and you know, so – have you gone that far to kind of start to put together a protocol that way as well? Like what that return should look like? Absolutely. So, so what I say to my patients now, so any, let's just say, I mean, I take care of a ton of, of high school collegiate athletes to tear their ACL a lot. Right. So for them now, I'm saying, you know, you're doing PT formal physical therapy with a physical therapist for probably seven months. And then um, in conjunction with a physical therapist, some type of agility coach, you know, bridge training yep, for another yes. two months. And the way that I almost explained to him is that I want to see the case being made for you to return to play. And, and what that has to go. be, what, what do I, what are, they, what are you showing me? Right. Like, what have you done? 
what does he look like? You know, my collegiate athletes, I'm doing a lot of telemedicine visit now because I'm seeing a lot of collegiate athletes from all over mm. and I will, um, you know, I'll talk to the, uh, to the, to the athletic trainer, physical therapist over zoom with them. And I kind of say like, so, you know, tell me what they've done and they, they break it down and it has to be video it has to be whatever. I just operate on a, uh, a Clemson football player. Um, and, and, you know, his, his father's actually very involved. He said, look, they, this is what they've done. And I said, well, have him send me videos, send me something so mm -hmm. I can see, um, that he's ready to go, you know, cause it's, it's, I mean, quite frankly, I mean, my part at that point, I mean, unless there's significant swelling, but by five months, the range of motion is good. Yep. And realistically, I'm not doing much after that. And that's just, like, I mean, you guys do all the work, you Correct. know, honestly, I'm not just saying yep. that. So yep. um, I'm like, I need to see the case. And because I, I really firmly believe, you know, doing 200 ACLs a year, I mean, if I can get my failure rate to half a percent, 1%, that would still keep me up at night because it's still a few people here. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and that's, you know, that's the biggest thing we see because over the past 20 years, we know the organized sports has gotten even more aggressive. Um, we know that we're seeing that it's happening younger and younger, but then, you know, like, why is that? What what are the kids missing? And Joe was talking about it is a foundation. It's a very sport specific, but a lot of them don't have those foundational things to be able to execute the movements that they need in the sport. You know, lunges, squats, single leg stability, change of direction control, because they're not doing enough of those things to challenge those muscle groups. Yeah. And when you have them in PT and they're doing it for the first time, you know, their legs are shaking. And we haven't even, you know, this is with, even with or without BFR, you know, and, and, and doing all these things to challenge them. But then they want to go do three hour practices or time under tension, you yeah. know, and there's not enough of that talk about the nutrition, the rest, the hydration, all these things that we're learning now that come into, again, sport is human performance. And these, you know, high school kids are being pushed at these peak levels and they're still not fully developed. And I'm glad that you said what you did, Dr. Dodson, because that's what I say to a lot of these parents is, well, explain to me how, you know, your 16 year old daughter has the same, you know, ligament injury that we saw, you know, on Monday night with a pro football uh, star. What happened there? That mechanism of injury, we step and we plant and then a ligament goes. And sometimes we have videos of just a girl in her backyard dribbling a ball and the knee goes. I mean, it's just, it's not normal. So we're trying to go through the, these steps too to prevent that because it, it does take a mental toll on the kid. You know, this is not what a teenager should be doing. I mean, all these girls know each other in the clinic. They're spending their teenage years in a PT clinic. And yeah. you see the reports we send you. We're trying to utilize some of the things we have here to show, you know, these are the checkpoints of what is improving, what they need to work on. And then they're ready to go for the next phase. And these are things we're doing. We, we're trying to build an algorithm of, of where these athletes are going, you know, and step by step, you know, but even to back that up a little bit, when you talk about, you know, some of the failure rates, you know, I think that's important too. And kind of maybe can you touch a little bit on, on some of the procedures that you're doing some of the things a little bit differently, because we are seeing there's some newer techniques involving the IT band or like I, yeah. I messaged you about an anterior approach now for hamstring yeah. graft. I mean, just some of those things. Sure. So that's, I mean, I think one of the, <laughs> One of the, I mean, you could have, we could talk about this for, I could talk about this for literally days, you know, <laughs> and, and I mean that in a good way. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things, so, so the, you know, everyone always asked about graphs. So graphs definitely matter, right? How can they not? Um, and the reason why they matter is because nobody fixes all the graphs the same way. And so if you were building a house and I was telling you that I was going to use this and, you know, this uh, lumber and fix it with this way. And then someone came and said, well, I'm going to build your house, but do this way. You would say, well, what's the difference in how he's, you know, he's fixing it and she's fixing it. Right. So, you know, I, I do a lot. I do really three different graphs, but I definitely do them in, in, in different athletes. And my younger athletes, I only use their own tissue. We're not sure why, but it definitely seems to matter. If you use cadaver or allograft in younger patients, the failure rate is much higher to the tune of 30%. That's very well established now. So, so why is that? Could you say it's biology? Could you say that they feel better quicker? We don't really know. Probably, I think biology, but that kind of that kind of matters. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of patellar tendon grafts for young, competitive athletes. So, in my practice, high school, collegiate, professional, elite, you know, athletes get patellar tendon graft because mm. I believe in that fixation and that graft healing. I do hamstring grafts as well. I do cadaver grafts as well. We're seeing a lot more quad tendon grafts kind of come out there now. Mm. I'm not, in my opinion, I'm not quite sure where the verdict is on that yet. I think, again, it has to do with fixation. Mm -hmm. We fix tissue in tunnels differently than bone in tunnels. So that that has to matter. 
Um, you know, I did see a, a, a high, I saw a fair number of, of relatively acute failures uh, last June in soft tissue grafts in young athletes, which kind of made me really think about that. So um, to your point, Mike, um, in, in revisions now, um, I am adding a graft in the outside of the knee called an anterolateral ligament reconstruction or ALL. Uh, some people do it with an IT band, but the idea is to add an extra strut to control rotation. And, and, and our French colleague, uh, Bertrand Cottery um, really, really taught me about that. A lot of us in America, you know, he does a really high volume ACLs in France. Um, he only does hamstring grafts, but he um, has done series. We looks at hamstring grafts with and without that added reconstruction. I think his failure rate went from like eight, nine, ten percent to one percent. So that that's kind of the cutting edge for me right now. In all revisions, young athletes, I'm adding that graft in the outside. I'm sure you guys have seen patients might have done that in. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, you know, autograph young athlete person as well. I, I feel strong in those things. And I try and based on science, you know, and not just opinion. You know, it's crazy that you brought that up too, because I just had a girl that I worked with back in 2003. She was a soccer player at Penn and she tore her ACL and I had made a post on Instagram and she you know, responded, Hey, listen, you forgot about me, blah, blah, blah. And then she said to me, uh, side note. I had a um, cadaver uh, graft done back in 2003. I was doing uh, box jumps and I was playing recreational soccer and I was get, starting to get some discomfort. I went to the surgeon. They did an MRI. It comes to be that the, the graft that was put in there has been stretched so much that it is acting as if there's no ACL in there yeah. now. Yeah. We see that a lot. I mean, the data now is pretty clear. You know, um, I'm blanking the gentleman's name, but there's a gentleman from University of Arizona several years ago presented data at the NFL Combine. He actually stopped the study. He was doing cadaver graphs and all his Division One athletes, and the failure rate was so bad he stopped the study. Um, you know, at at Rothman, when I first got here, there were some surgeons who were doing um, cadaver graphs and patients. We we used 25 as kind of the cutoff as as young, quote unquote. Um, and, you know, we, you know, back then it, it wasn't clear. There's some advantage we thought of using cadaver graft. I, I had always done uh, autographs to young patients because I was trained at special surgery, but we did a study and sure enough, the failure rate was higher. Um, you know, and again, when you're doing a high volume, every percentage point matters. So I think that that's pretty clear now. I think using your own tissue when you're younger really matters. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, obviously different grafts are fixed differently. Um, and it definitely matters as you're older um, and you're probably less, um, you know, a little less active that you could probably get away with uh, different types of graph. You know, again, a 70 year old and a, I'm 45 now. I mean, you know, I, I can't even sprint anymore, let alone play soccer. So, <laughs> so, so you know, it, it matters, right? You yep, know? yep. I think my goals return if I injure skiing with my kids is different than if I was 17. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and that, I think that comes down to it too, again, is, you know, why, why did this graft, you know, why the ligament tear in the first place and obviously protecting the graft again, you know, the muscles are not, are not performing, they're not doing their function. And then maybe they might perform with a couple, you know, reps and sets when you're fresh or what happens when you're fatigued, what happens in that, that last quarter of the game. And that's why it's very interesting to see injuries happen when it's like in the beginning of the game. You know, what was this athlete doing the night prior? What was what was the week leading up to? What's yep. their, you know, what's going on with their, you know, biophysiology, you know, as, as an individual? And these are a lot of things we're starting to look at as we have more things, you know, fitness trackers, heart rate monitors, you know, all these things available and, and better understanding of, of human performance. I feel like athletes will probably be like cyborgs in the next 10 years. But, you know, there's still these things you got to look at. And I think our biggest challenge is even though we're doing, if we're building this algorithm, you know, how do we get the, the you know, the kids to be doing stuff outside? you know, practicing the things to, to carry over between each session. So they meet those goals. I mean, do you, do you have any strategies or do you find some of those similar things, even at the pro level in terms of motivating these athletes, you know, obviously it's devastating and saying, look, like here's where we want to be. And you talk about, we have these goals of return to play, but a lot of it is the more you put into it, the more you're going to reach these milestones. Absolutely. So, you know, I have two, I have three children, I have two daughters and, you know, we know this epidemic of ACL and in, in, in female athletes, but certainly I see my, my share of male athletes as well. You know, I'm trying to get them, my oldest is 14, my middle child's 12. So they're getting near that age where I'm trying to convince them to do some type of um, um, preventive program. I think mm -hmm. it's a little, I mean, I would say when you, when I see an athlete in the clinic with an ACL tear, mom or dad asked me, 
predictably two questions. Uh, well, really three. The first is when can you do it? But the second one is, <laughs> you know, um, what's the likelihood it happens again? And the third question is, what's the chance it happens to the other knee? Mm-hmm. And I always say, now that you've been through this once, I think I have an easier time convincing you that the best way to prevent it from happening again and the other knee is to do prophylactic training with people like yourself. Mm-hmm. I was like, it's hard to convince particularly kids to do that because, you, you know, we all felt like we were invincible at 16 and exactly. 17, right? So yeah. it's hard, but at least now that it's happened, this is the best way to prevent it from happening, particularly the other knee, because that's, in my practice, what I've seen is the highest risk is, is a contralateral knee. So yep. that's really critical. And I kind of point that out. And again, with our elite athletes, I think that that's one thing I've also seen change over the last decade. I think that they train more and harder and are more in tune to that and mm-hmm. want to have longevity in their career and prevent injury. I think the elite athletes get that at least it seems to me more than they ever have. And so we don't have to say much. I mean, I, they, they, you know, we have phenomenal athletic trainers and physical therapists and all the teams that really work with them and, and do, and do, um, you know, preventive stuff so that they get the importance of, being healthy and being available as far as longevity, the career contracts, et cetera. So we don't have to do much work with them, but, uh, but you know, with the younger athletes, we have to, and I think, unfortunately it's easier to convince them when something bad's happened. Absolutely. So I said, you get, you get their attention more when you have an injured athlete, right? I have way better attrition rate with these kids when they're injured than when they're coming in just to strength train to get better for their sport. You know, they find yeah. this, they, they'll they find any reason to come up with an excuse why they can't make it. But yet when you're injured, you're you're trying to figure out, can I make it in an extra day? Can I do this? What can I do to get better? Right. You're doing anything you can to not be hurt anymore. And, and, and there's data behind that. You know, Bert, Bert Mandelbaum, uh, you know, um, who's done a lot of work with U.S. soccer. I mean, you know, he looked he did that comparison of um, he, he he published that paper with the um, with the. Uh, you know, proprioceptive strength program, training program, and compared it to uh, two um, female soccer teams, one who did it, one didn't. I, I believe the number is 30% reduction in ACL injuries. It okay. was significant. So yeah. there's yeah. science behind it. I tell patients, you can find that paper and find that program online. Like it's, it's, it's real. It's not, you know, this isn't like, you know, made up. So it's, it's really important. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was going to yeah. say that too, that we would be doing the same things, even if you didn't tear the ACL. Your deficits, your deficits. Yep. Let's get to a for the ligament tears, and you have to go through all this because you have your deficits, your deficits. We have to work on that. You know, if you can't demonstrate these shapes and positions, especially under fatigue or high volume, that's the problem. And then eventually the muscles give out, and guess what takes the blow? The ligament. But it's interesting you said that too because we are finding once we're analyzing these kids moving, the non-operative leg is the problem leg. I've seen that in probably nine out of ten past patients it's wild and yeah. they're saying but this is my, my bad side so that's why we're looking at some of these things that are comparing to the good side but nobody said that that side was good you know right. you could be carrying a really bad leg to another bad leg so we got to look at you know that's why the new studies are looking at the limb symmetry index with the limb quality index what is both limb doing in these shapes and movements you might be good here but both your legs are not good in this position so we got to work on those things and now trying to look at you know that goes into the treatment program and, and all that Dr. Dotson, I know we're up against the uh, up against our time here, so I do have one question. Yep. I know you are a major part of the Philadelphia Eagles, so how does everybody? How is everyone feeling this week? You know, I think we're going to be. I think we're, everyone's be ready to go. I mean, it's going to be a great environment. I'll be at the game Saturday night, and awesome. uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the team. Um, you've had such a great season. Um, you know, we have such a you know a great team, and it's a great locker room, and um those guys are amazing so hopefully hopefully we get a w and keep it going i think uh, there's a lot of excitement and uh i'm certainly looking forward to it i mean i really again i I thank you so much i know you're super busy so to take this time for us i I really appreciate it and hopefully we can get you on again yeah absolutely anytime you need me i'm here this was great awesome awesome have a great day let's go birds take care let's go talk to you take care